Okay, um, we are back to, with the Natural Awakening podcast with me, your host, Wiston. Today's guest is Peter McEwen. Is that, am I pronouncing your last name right? Perfectly. All right. Thank um, you. Peter, um, for those who don't know, um, who are you? Uh, what do you do? How how did you get here? Uh, well, I'm from California. My family is from the Chiricahua region of Southern Arizona, and they're indigenous people on the mother's side. So I had, I wouldn't call the, my, my dad kind of disappeared when I was young. So I was raised by a, like a matrilineal indigenous culture. And so I grew up around people maybe who don't have the Western typical middle class education that a lot of um, my colleagues in the Dharma might have. So I was raised by my grandparents. This is really important to sort of like who I am, where I'm from. I grew up in this very unusual amalgam of Roman Catholicism and indigenous belief systems. So I was brought up to believe in changeling shamans who may be sort of disguised as a crow or as like a black cat but also we had you know like candle like almost like a santeria home life where there's candles burning to the virgin mary everywhere uh, my grandfather dropped out of school when he was eight to work on the railroads and my grandmother dropped out of school around 15 i think to take care of her family members and shortly thereafter started producing children so I kind of, and then, you know, became an altar boy, uh, went to Catholic school for certain stints, but I just had sort of an unusual upbringing of being the only white kid in this extended brown family. So that was really pivotal. I don't, I'm still surfacing why that feels so strange to me, but that was really important to me from the perspective of maybe I didn't have the intellectual support or my grandparents maybe didn't have the capacity to police my schooling as well as would have been um, preferred. And so I grew up, you know, a lot of people in my family have diabetes and um, anxiety issues. And there's a history of substance abuse and violence and things like that. So you grow up around that and you, you end up adopting a lot of that. So I grew up with a lot of anxiety, like a lot of anxiousness, um, maybe didn't feel safe. And so over time, you know, I got interested in ways of probably moderating anxiety, uh, reading about the brain, uh, reading about meditation. And eventually when I was going to school in Santa Barbara, I ran into a uh, amazing teacher named Lama Tarchin. This is in the early 90s. I'm now 51. And Alan Wallace was teaching at UC Santa Barbara too during this period. So I would say, you know, this arc of like anxiety dropping out of high school, even though I was a National Merit Scholar, because of panic, not wanting to be in a classroom, fearful, I was going to have like a nervous breakdown and be shamed by classmates. Uh, that was really formational for me i think that like intense experience of of suffering and inner chaos and then lo and behold around age 20 21 i had a spontaneous awakening experience and basically all suffer self referential talk dropped and there was just open perfect dynamic energe energetic colorful space uh, and ever since those two, ex I mean, it kind of escalated. I had probably two to five of those experiences of maybe sense of self collapsing. And then of course you return to normal yeah, experiencing, sure. right? But and that's when the most, path most of the time that doesn't, that doesn't last. It's like the self comes out me up, comes back online. It's like, Whoa, um, excuse me. Yeah. What? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I think about Eckhart Tolle a lot, and, you know, I, I almost was that much of a, um, I was just so destroyed by the experience. I might as well have been living on a park bench. I, you know, I had no reference point left. There was this 
sense of extreme suffering that collapsed and then this sense of openness and peace and connection and then ever since you know alternating between those two extremes and then over time practitioners it seems like as you mature as a practitioner we start dissolving the apparent distinction between enlightened experience or wakeful experience open experiencing and the contraction of being a significant and suffering person there's a wonderful uh, quote that might be relevant here um shinzen uh, one of my teachers was on japanese television um <laughs> I, I can't remember him. in what, what decades but decades ago um uh -huh. you know while he was still a monk i believe um i could be wrong but anyway um he was with a, a very senior Roshi um, and Shinzen was the, the most ju junior most and the TV interviewer who was sincerely interested in, um, you know, Kensho Satori awakening. And he asked um, directly. So, you know, getting right down to it, what is Kensho? What is Satori? Um, what is, what is awakening? Um, and Shinzen being the most junior looked to the next most senior and the next most senior looked to the, to the senior <laughs> most Roshi. <laughs> and the Roshi said, um, well, I suppose you could say in the end, it's the passing away of the distinction between uh, awakening and non-awakening. So, yeah. <laughs> I like that story. That's a much more succinct <laughs> version of my tale. I'm going to use that from now on. No, no, please do. And uh, I, I will try to find that link uh, to Shinzen actually um, talk, telling that story. He tells it much better. Um. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think some of that, for those of us who are interested in path work, is just evolve not evolving but actually surrendering to immediate sensation level experience and just engaging fully and that's pretty much the best i can do you know what i mean there's there's no resolution to my life basically i'm just engaging as best i can like every like all like all of the practitioners who are listening to this probably and, and anyone who just says they're doing anything else <laughs> yeah. really and well, secondarily, I think part of that is expanding our tolerance for intensity, basically, because we the moment open awareness kind of arises in our experience, we want to contract back to a more familiar sense of um, significant selfhood, depending on the intensity of the open experience. But you know, and some of that comes into theories about bardo and basically tolerance for mystery. And I think a, a practitioner that's probably mature in their practice just has a high tolerance for not knowing who they are. No, I mean, another Zen quote, not knowing is closest to it. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> another great quote. Zen and Dzogchen, um, uh, they're, you know, they might, they're, 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 they might as well be twins, as far as I'm concerned, having practiced significantly now in both. Yeah, I think, I mean, even philosophically, they're both associated with mind-only school, too. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. um, that's a big debate. I'm not willing to get we're into it. We're not going to relitigate the Samye debate. We don't have to go there. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> I'm here to offend people, just not on that topic. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We we can we can let sleeping dogs lie there. Um. Um. Well, great. Um. You you mentioned how you kind of uh, began to you encountered a teacher. You began to practice. Um. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of how that has gone on? And I know now you're you've you've gotten to the point. I'm not sure how long ago of being a lay ordained uh, practitioner, a, a nakba. Um, uh. Yeah. I've been a lay ordained nakba since 2006, I think, something like that. And you get ordained a number of times, basically, because it's associated with a certain empowerment. And oftentimes when you receive a full cycle, an Anu tantric cycle, you will get ordained again. So many practitioners have been ordained. Very few maybe pick it up as being sort of like the traditional role of being sort of intermediary between community concerns and community practice and monastic practice. So you 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 have you kind of occupy this liminal space between both views right the more householder view and then the more traditional vinaya 
uh, vows that a, a monk would take. And then we have the lamas that occupy a space of kind of doing whatever they want. It seems like most of the time and sort of that's under the, the rubric of, oh, well, I'm a llama. I'm doing what's most efficacious for what's going on at the teaching. I I'm appearing, my appearance has to do with what's going to benefit sentient beings. So for my teacher, that might be very strict monastic Mahayana kind of teachings all the way to householder teachings at the tantric level. Uh, that being said, I did my first Nandro under the supervision of Tulku Organ, who is a reincarnated Lama from the Pemaku region of Northern India, where Dujim Rinpoche and many of the Nyingma Lamas escaped to yep. in the um, 50s. And he runs a temple Dharma program there. And they, you know, they have a hospital there and they bring in better medical care. It's also called the hidden land. So for me, that was like really big deal, like meeting a llama that spends six months a year in Pamaku in this really remote region of Northern India. And then he comes to America and gives teachings and you just get a real portal into hillbilly hillbilly vajrayana as i like to term it <laughs> you know what i mean like this yeah, really yeah. old way of 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 doing practice and you know maybe some of those teachers and practitioners maybe they're at a different developmental plateau maybe they actually f believe in gyalpo's and Lokapalas as really embodied real things mm -hmm. and maybe someone who's at a more like green or pluralistic level would consider them ah oh, maybe they are maybe they aren't but it was really interesting for me to just be associated and have the supervision from a llama like Tulku Organ and Baka Tulku Rinpoche who escaped with the first lot of Nyingma Lamas from uh, Eastern Tibet into Pemaku and he is who I received my first uh tantric empowerments and then uh, is he also one of um ian baker uh is he also yeah, one of ian baker's he, teachers yeah right. sure. okay both are friends with ian baker because they're sort of like helped guide him in the pemaku region because they're, right. they're both i mean toko organ was born there so he knows the lay of the land and not to belabor this but then <laughs> <laughs> they introduced me to Zongsar Kinsa Rinpoche, who is my current root teacher. And I also did my another root teacher would be Lama Pema Dorje Rinpoche, the Salong Lama, and my therapist, <laughs> Bruce Tift. Ah. Great book. Are already free. Highly recommend. Oh, yeah, Good, great, great book. I think he's probably the greatest genius in um, Vajrayana Buddhism in the West. So that's just my take. And I've been working with him since 2006. So I consider him a mentor as I got more involved in Vajrayana practice and therapy all at once. And I found it to be a really great complimentary, insane way to do business, so to speak. Complimentary, insane. That's, that's what we like to hear, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to completely um, throw all of our eggs into the spiritual practice basket and then leave all of our stuff, uh, emotional wounding, um, psychological deficits, behavioral issues undealt with. Yeah, exactly. We don't want that shadow to be looming all the time, just at certain times. <laughs> just when we're ready and have the capacity to actually work with it and bring it into a conscious awareness. Uh, we definitely don't want to be behaving in ways. And I found myself behaving in ways after my certain, my initial enlightened, what we call awakening experience in really short sighted. A big wow. Yeah. A really short sighted, selfish, bordering on, you know, narcissistic ways. Cause I didn't have the real world skills in my early twenties to behave like a kind empathetic being i was still acting out of really unskilled primitive ways of organizing reality yeah i mean that's something that's often not acknowledged that you know there are you know linked but not uh in lockstep levels of development or lines of development so i'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up you know um these these, these things don't 
always move in lockstep, psychological maturity, behavioral congruence, and um, perceptual shifts about self and reality. <laughs> well, I think that that brings up for me why I'm interested in translating some of the teachings I've received. And it has a lot more to do with inviting that complex amalgam of behaviors, historical conditioning, wakefulness, emotion, relational experiencing, and just doing the best we can and getting better at acting skillfully within the display of experience, but also being able to have a reference point of open mind, you know what I mean, without necessarily taking a side. Um, I try not to frame Tumo and some of the other things I've taught as being some sort of esoteric, out of reach, magical panacea. I, I view the heart of the Tumo practice as inviting existential intensity and metabolizing it at the navel center or in the central channel. That's a great way of phrasing it. Inviting, say, inviting existential intensity. Yeah, without falling into a formula or trying to escape into some sort of uh, spiritual paradise sure. or to try to escape into some relational um, complaint that, oh, this is too hard. This is something I can't do. This is, uh, this is just Tibetan superstition, whatever it is. You know, we're always trying to apply some sort of template onto our immediate experience. And I find practices like Tumo and inner heat yogas to be a great methodology or placebo, you could even call it, to call into question and investigate, you know, why do we feel like we need to escape our immediate embodied experience when we're holding our breath for a minute and a half? You know what I mean? And feel that like formless panic arise and do our best to encounter it and, um, not only encounter it, but to tolerate it, invite it, and make love to it. Yeah, wonderful. So for people who may not have heard of Tumo, I imagine <laughs> many people will have, but for those who haven't, um, I mean, maybe they can get some kind of idea from just what you've said so far, but could you give just a basic overview of, of what it is, how it comes to us, and, and how you teach it these days? Oh, well, I don't know how it comes to us. Some some say Naguma who is purportedly Milarepa's sister, sort of was one of the progenitors of this practice. I believe that it's probably a much more ancient practice. Perhaps it was stumbled upon by a cold person <laughs> during the Ice Age. I have really no idea. I consider it part of the human being's spiritual, spiritual heritage to basically use these latent capacities or I guess Jeffrey Kripal would even call it a superpower to use these capacities to heat one's body by holding the breath, experiencing great intensity and allowing the subtle energies to enter the central channel, which arouses a sense of bliss, warmth, and almost uh, a dissolution of subject and object. And so really what you're doing when you're doing the Tuma practice is you're doing postural activity, holding a visualization, which is integral to the success of being a, um, a successful Tuma practitioner and breath retention. And then once you can call into the central channel, the subtle airs, you can eventually begin to manipulate them to melt the kundalini centers and arouse various states of experience and bliss and warmth. Um, most practitioners that I've encountered probably don't get to the point where you're actually melting the kundalini from the various bindu or chakra centers. But I, th I think it's a really That's valuable... pretty intensive technical practice. Yeah, it's, and there's a lot of warnings about it. Maybe, you know, like losing losing your ground, grounding in consensus reality or getting really obsessed with only experiencing this, these blissful states, maybe not behaving as skillfully as, 
as one would be required in the West. And I think we're still discovering what the appropriate way to behave is after experiencing uh, spiritual awakenings is in the West. And if you're doing something like Tumo, it could be a very amplified version of awakening that may, we don't know, it may rob one of the ability to consciously participate in the immediate stream of their experience. Maybe they get obsessed with it and that's all they want to do. Or maybe they think they're some sort of superhuman guru or something like that. For my intents and purposes, when I teach it, I just want people to experience somatic intensity and work with them on experiencing that somatic intensity without falling into a formula or more metaphorically into a bardo, into right. like another version of themselves that is a symptomatic of escape. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for that 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 intro. That was that was that was pretty thorough. Um, and I know you've 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 run a couple of courses. Like, are there is there is there one coming up again? Uh, cohorts? I'm not sure uh, how you're running things these days. A, a light touch version of the Karma Mudra practice, which I think is another controversial practice. I just happen to be very interested in these practices because I don't think there is, as my teacher Zongsar Kinsa Rinpoche says. You know, there's nothing magic about this. <laughs> sure, sure. It's just a method. And so I personally have found using the practice of semen retention and conscious loving to be one of profound um, impact on my life. And I think certain aspects of the Karma Mudra practice and Tumo, again, have to do with not only experiencing intensity, inviting intensity, but making love to that intensity. And therefore, when we're in compromising relational um, exchanges with loved ones or at work, we're able to metabolize these intense feelings and sensations without, you know, blurting out something hurtful or, or trading our immediate experience for a formula. And that formula often is something very primitive, like it could be dominance or subjugation or pleasing someone so you don't have to actually encounter intensity, things like that. And lastly, I just think people are very interested in Westerners love Tantra because we're curious. Sure. People. Yeah. And, wait, and wait. I, there, we, we can experience non-conceptual bliss, the dissolution of, of self and have yeah. sex. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think my my version of karma mudra is, you know, if you can fuck the wall, that's that's my version of karma mudra. You know, if you if you're feeling pleasure from just breaking down this apparent sense of a problematic self, ah, it's just everything <laughs> kind of can like provide a blissful interlude for someone. Um, but a lot of us have a hard time letting our guard down enough to consciously love not only our own experience, but the world as it's arising. Because I think our number one neurotic habit is to avoid things we don't want to experience. It's so simple. Right? You of know course. I mean? so no, that's unpleasant. No, thank you. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> So I, I, those are just modalities I find helpful. <laughs> I don't know if other people do. And I do know a lot of men who are interested in the semen retention piece. And then there's also a component of it that may, uh, let's say, people who identify with having a masculine core or people who identify with having a feminine core. There's something in it for both orientations. And there's an opportunity in Karma Mudra to kind of switch roles. Until yeah, right. we wear wear down this again, this apparent conflict between masculine core experiencing and feminine core experiencing. Yeah, I mean, in in the culture, um, you know, online and in person and in all kinds of spaces, uh, you see just a lot of conflict and tension between the sexes. Um, you know, divides um, and just massive dissatisfaction and suffering with people's sexual and relational lives. That's, I mean, that's what I see anyway. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we, we have these tools that can basically 
transmit a lot of information and some of that's going to be about sane experiencing and some of that's going to be about neurotic experiencing around probably disowned uh, core energies and that could be a disowned masculine and masculine i'm going to use masculine just i don't want to sure. be we can we can we can work with the binary you know okay. just it's two ends of a spectrum whatever right so, you know, some people are disowning masculine energies, some feminine energies, and of course that's going to come out as people broadcast their views on these. They're not a hot button topic. They're, it's just a, a matter of like how much tolerance people have for um, complexity, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we could go into a lot more detail on kind of any of these subjects. So feel free to like circle back. Um, okay. and if I, if I, I may come with more questions, but you're giving very, you're very, giving very concise answers. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that also comprehensive. Of, that's <laughs> so. part of my, that's part of my role in my effort to teach. I'm not a great teacher, but I'm learning to teach. And I think the more I can be the location of awareness in relationship to someone who wants to learn a method. And the more articulate I can become, hopefully, the more they're going to adopt that methodology and gain some benefit from that, whether that's a therapeutic modality or that's a spiritual path oriented modality. My bias is that we don't have to take a side and that doing a practice like Tumo or Karma Mudra has applications that will improve our personal experience. And it also has applications to it that will improve, not improve, but like open us to the, our capacity to just be nothing, to be open to what's arising in the stream of our experience. And I think, you know, a lot of us who grew up doing Dharma practice, we're very sensitive to this notion of bypassing. And I think a lot of the efforts I've made as a practitioner, certainly, and someone who's trying to translate this for other lay people is I want to put in control so they're not bypassing because we've all seen the results of that. It creates a lot of disembodiment, suffering. And Case A here, not yeah. anymore so Me much. Too. But um... Right. <laughs> you know, I'm just a confused human being. That's what I that's what I am. <laughs> so as soon as I as soon as I got my grubby mitts on some meditative pleasure and concentration and the ability to dissolve discomfort and suffering through yeah. you know all of these various methods, boy, <laughs> what I, any conventional psychological work? Absolutely not. I will I will enjoy my blissful absorption. Um, this is obviously your your problem. I'm fine. Goodbye. Um, right. I don't do that so much anymore. <laughs> it was it was an issue though. Oh, I burned that bridge with with the heat of my meditative capacities. That's what happened. <laughs> um, and I see this a lot with people interested in the Dzogchen methods. Uh, you know, within strict Nyingma, the, yana, the nine yana system, you should probably be adept at the Maha Yoga generation practice. Sure. Mm -hmm. Completion practices. Some people aren't going to be familiar with. What, what, can you just go into a little more detail about what creation, what completion? You know these these various. You know, uh, in a little more detail, because some people aren't going to have heard of deity yoga. I mean, that's a huge topic. But so many of you will be familiar with these paintings of uh, dakinis and deities in union, and so the idea here is when you do a specific yidam practice which just means like a pledge being you you enact and visualize yourself you create the clarity and awareness of being a deity which serves a number of functions but primarily the function of replacing the habitual conditioned sense of self-image that we all walk around with so that it would be considered in a nutshell uh, obviously, there's like very elaborate teachings on generation practice in all the lineages, including Shingon. But I'm just giving you all an idea of, okay, I am, I am this person who's having a hard time finding a job, or I am this person who is often in conflict with my mates' intentions. 
So we'll, we'll take that sort of what Lama Yeshe, the great yogi would say, that self-pity mind, and we replace it with the mind of the deity, which is ultimately like, like completely scalable, completely lucid, totally sane. And we habituate our mind, body, and speech to behave like this. And some of this mentality has been adopted by modern new age movements with if I feel rich, I become rich. <laughs> manifestation. I, manifestation. Manifestation. <laughs> and to some degree, there's some truth, I think, to that. Sure. Uh, I don't think it's going to reveal the citadel of awareness or, you know, enlightenment. <laughs> but it's probably going to improve your experience. And sure, I think positive psychology. You know? That's great. Uh, the completion practice would be to enact this new You've now replaced your self-image. Now you have this new self-image. You've become Chenrezi or Vajrayogini or what your chosen deity or the deity your teacher has given you. And in many cases in the West, you have like 30 deities that you're supposed to be honoring and visualizing. The and advice so I've received is one is good enough. Just, 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 it's really, it's really fine. <laughs> right. And so many people will pick Padmasambhava or Yeshe Sogyal. But now you enact the deity. So you, sor you sort of like, you start visualizing the subtle body's architecture, the topology of the chakra system, the winds and the channels. And then you begin to manipulate these, this new toolkit of the deity and arouse various states of bliss, supernormal powers, maybe the accoutrement of being this enlightened form the ornaments of the natural state as they're exactly. sometimes called thank you you're, you're a lot more eloquent than i am and i appreciate that no i just read too much <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so that would be the completion stage also known as tantra um anu yoga or anuttara tantra yoga in the galuk system and then finally we have in the nine yana system Kagyu and the Gluk have it differently and the Sakyapas have it differently. I'm sticking to Nyingma here. You have Dzogchen, Mahaati, ah, yep. which is it, it's a nested hierarchy, right? You have generation stage nested in Anu Yoga, nested in the Dzogchen practices of great perfection. Within Togal and Trekcho, you actually, it's going to benefit your Dzogchen practice by having some capacity and facility to operate with this subtle body, um, with the winds, channels, and chakras. So Yeah, I'm not sure how much detail you want to go into that, th those later Dzogchen esoterica. Um, I think I, uh, I would, people, I would people, rather... different people have different comfort levels with discussing that, that kind of stuff. So I, 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 we didn't discuss beforehand. I don't know where you're at with that. <laughs> I have no problem discussing it because for most of us, including myself, it's still a fantasy. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's an aspiration. And so I think that's why I chose to teach Tumo because I saw a lot of really misleading, damaging notions of what it is on YouTube. Mm. And and mm. on various internet forums. And I was like, well, it's out there. Why not do it sure. correctly and introduce people to these concepts and practices so they can try it for themselves and see if they can pull it off. And if they yeah, can, I mean, great, I'm here for you. And if you can't, also great, because now you realized maybe that there's a formless panic at the core of your being. And <laughs> after, after holding your breath for a minute, you're about to like lose your shit. <laughs> Maybe maybe before you call yourself an online Dzogchen master, we, we we should inquire where you're at in your practice and work with where you're actually at. Um, I just wanted to say with the Dzogchen stuff, I hear a lot about it on Twitter and YouTube and this and that. And although there's a few informed voices, I think a lot of it's just people reading books, and that's great. Sure, but I think you, you're gonna have a much better, more accurate experience. And if your intention is to practice Dzogchen by working with a teacher who probably received it from a teacher. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's why I chose my teacher. He was raised, he's Dujim Rinpoche's um, grandchild, Tinley Norbu's son, 
and was trained by Dilgo Kensa Rinpoche. So for me, as you an don't really Italian, have a, a, a better <laughs> pedigree. I mean, that's maybe not the right word, but that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but for me, I was like, well, I want to learn Dzogchen, so I should learn it from probably someone who was trained in it. And um, I would like to see more of that. Yeah, of people who have had an introduction to it and maybe haven't just watched a few podcasts. And I think those of us like yourself who are interested in transmitting and just helping people along with that, that's great. I don't see that as super harmful. I think that's, and then there's also more experienced teachers and we can direct them to those teachers. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I discussing with my own teacher, he's like, great. I'm happy you're doing your secular teaching, you know, under the auspices of Shinzen's organization. I think what Shinzen is doing is great. And, um, you know, if people want traditional Dzogchen teachings, you should direct them elsewhere. And I am very happy to do so. I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I have an encounter, you know, that's another thing we encounter a lot in our path work is this seeming apparent conflict people have with being a self or not a self. But until I actually encounter someone who does not behave as though they're a, a concrete self, you know, I'm going to anticipate that they're going to continue behaving like a self. So I'm not that anxious that they're not getting the full Monty of like what Zogchen practices. Zogchen practice is not an, a method. Strictly speaking, it's it's probably fully being fully engaged in your immediate experience without exception. Yeah. And that's hard to do. And that's, that to me is the heart of the Mahamudra and Dzogchen practices. And there are all of these esoteric methods, you know, visionary yogas, um, you know, there are preparatory methods, some quite intensive, um, right. even harrowing <laughs> of, of, of putting the body under a lot of stress, and doing all of these fancy things. And you can read more about that. All of this is you know, publicly published information these days. Um, so. Right. Like for Rushen, which is the preliminary practice for Dzogchen, that's very uncomfortable. You actually put yourself into postures where you're just in fucking agony in order to <laughs> note, it, in order to note, but this is sort of like the child of Tumo a little bit where you put yourself in these somewhat unnatural postures that are nonsensical. A lot of my students in the Tumo thing, I think we're just like, what the fuck? Why are we like clapping our hands and, and visualizing <laughs> And what does this have to do with acupuncture and Chinese medicine? I was like, it has nothing to do with anything. It's completely made up and it, but it works. <laughs> it's sort of like, it's sort of like magic doesn't work in theory, but it works in practice. And I would say right. the same about Tantra. A Peter yeah. Carroll said that a famous chaos that's, magician. And I think that's great. Tantra, that's great. Tantra, Tantra is the same. I'm going to steal that. That's great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably talking too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is all. This is all really, really good. I get excited <laughs> about these topics. So. No, I do too. I do too. Um, and what people tend to enjoy hearing excited people talk about things that they're excited about. That's huh. that's kind of the reason I started this podcast because I wanted to have these conversations, and people seem some people seem to be interested. So that's that's why we're here. Um, yeah. Um, do you offer anything on the Dzogchen end of things or are you mainly just teaching the, I'm the going side to, of things? I'm going to, I'm just starting. Um, I did one-on-one -on -one sessions since 2016. And for me, teaching publicly is a new thing. I didn't want to get into it prematurely because I think it's a lot to people put your their vulnerability in your hands. And so you have to really be responsible about transmitting and being a good caretaker. And so I have a discord and anyone who's listening to this, please reach out to me if you want to join our discord where I'm available to answer questions on Tumo practice, six yogas, dream yoga, um, mag magic and Buddhism, Dzogchen practice in my experience. Um, I've been in That's a an incredible resource. So people take, take Peter up on that offer. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I want people to feel held in these practices and I want, I received my transmissions from whom I think is a really great teacher, Zongsar Kinsar Rinpoche, Baka Tulku, 
Emma Dorje and Bruce Tiff. They are my mentors and my heart teachers. And I just want to share what I've learned from people who came from that, not Bruce, but who came from the East and were not only engaged, but have done serious retreat time in these practices. I personally, I'm in a strange retreat program, which is a, it's a three-year retreat program that it's sort of like, um, I've been in it for 12 or 13 years now, and we're far past the three year end of the three year retreat, so to speak, you know, we're in the like 20,000 hours of practice at this point. So my teacher prefers that style because he used to put people in three year retreat and then they would come out and they wouldn't know how to operate in the West. Like, Oh, I've heard lots is, of stories. Of, what, is the, of, what is a like MacBook or what, you know, how, how do I get a job now? You know, and he really wanted us to do a lot of retreat time during the year and then commit to, you know, two to three hours per day. And, and then to Meeson's question, you know, then he will call us individually and say, I don't want to go into too much detail, but sure. he'll say, okay, meet me in LA in two days or some, like some really cool, it's cool. You're like, your teacher's like, yeah, meet me in Vancouver in a couple of days. I need to give a small group a transmission and teachings on, oftentimes it's Anu Yoga or Dzogchen. And that's basically for the past I don't know if it's 16 years how I've been getting my education is through these, the big retreat. And then you'll go do a month long retreat on a Yidam and try to accomplish that practice. And then right. the teacher will come and give us direct teachings on whatever it is. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds like a really skillful adaptation of the tradition to contemporary conditions. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I think, but I think for me, the shortcoming is that the Tibetans are so nervous about the Samaya associated with Dzogchen and some of these practices. To me, it's distribution time. That's my, and I've done a lot of praying on this and appealed to protector beings. And, you know, <laughs> and I feel like as long as you're doing thing respons things responsibly and holding your students in as much compassion and sanity as is possible, it's okay to discuss with them privately their path work and how they, you can help them get more in alignment with their own intentions and goals. I mean, that, that's, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, so... One final question, and then maybe we can circle back if anything else surfaces. Sure, um, before my camera on. overheats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we were asked on Twitter, but again, by by Misen, um, what your artistic practice um, is is like. I didn't I didn't know you were really into photography. That's 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 cool to hear. Um, how has that interacted with your Dzogchen practice, your tantric practice? What's so, what's the kind of reciprocal relationship there? Yeah, so I think. You know, I've been a practitioner since 1992 and I've done a lot of retreat time. So any given year, even if I had a job, I would spend probably like months of that year just in retreat. And then I'd, ha I'd have to work to make a lot of money fast. So I had food to get me through uh, like retreat time, um, space time. <laughs> and so... Uh, I learned commercial photography and I used, I trained myself in HTML, CSS and early, you know, front end engineering and user interface design, um, to make ends meet. Cause to me, that was the, that's a concentrate, that's a way to make a concentrated amount of cash in a short amount of time. Right. That and makes sense. Even, that, that's I've good even, for the retreat lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, my main inspiration and priority has always been Dharma practice since I entered adulthood. I've taught at the local at CU Boulder too. I've taught um, product design and some branding. So I've tried to do my best with it, but in terms of photography, it's probably my favorite of the crafts that I do because and Zongsar Kinsar Rinpoche is also an inspiration. He's a filmmaker. So I think I was always inspired by him. My father's an illustrator. So I was 
brought up around paint and this, the art institute in San Francisco. So I think I have a basic facility to for composition and color. But for me, some of the preliminary practices of like the Togal Zogchen is to look and know. And when you're knowing, you're not like absorbed in the display or dakini, maybe some people would call it. You're not absorbed in the, the display of experience. There's cognizance and display. And when that breaks down, sometimes I can pull off a, a decent picture um, because I've kind of dropped my agenda and I'm more sensitive to how that picture may maybe maybe capture the i hate to use this word but the soul of sure what yeah. i'm like i mean it's just a at. word <laughs> yeah thank you i like wisdom always gives me permission thank you <laughs> everyone praise wisdom so i, I Please would don't say, it's very embarrassing <laughs> so i would say that that's my approach to commercial photography and also i think i like to capture people's souls in my in my camera <laughs> Right, right. But no, that's that's a great way as a connection practice. I don't I don't really feel the need to turn everything into a Buddhist practice, but in retrospect, if you look at my work, a lot of it's portraiture. Sure. And just trying to capture my connection and like sort of this heartfelt feeling I have towards someone in a picture is really special to me. Especially for someone who has like a masculine aggressive core style it's good for me to have some instrumentation around feeling connected to my community i used to throw a lot of parties which are sort of like i always thought of them as a soak practice um like a tantric assembly i guess for those yeah. of you who aren't that familiar but it's mostly just a party and it's unmediated and there's no agenda and everyone's and there's lots of food and it feels abundant and there's a lot of love and music and dancing. So those are my, I guess, secular versions that no yeah. one would ever notice. They're just, oh, a party. Oh, he takes pictures. But my the subtext is it kind of fulfills that yearning to do some engaged Buddhism. And then lastly, I've worked for the United Nations peacekeepers. I've worked for... Uh, the non-proliferation think tank for the United Nations. I worked for the Jean-Michel Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau's son. So I've tried to do as much good work as possible. I've failed a lot, but um, there is an effort there to to contribute. I think. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, effort is all you can give in the end. <laughs> More permission. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, it's wonderful to hear you, you speak about your, your, your practice in that way. Um, it, it's reminding me a lot of, um, though I never met him, the, the founding abbot of Zen Mountain Monastery, where I trained wow. ending last year for about 13 months straight. Tell um, me. <laughs> John Dido Lori, um, Roshi, uh, mm. was one of Taizan Maizumi Roshi's, uh, he was one of, one of his heirs. Um, and he, he was a, he was an industrial chemist, I think, before anything else. But he, all, but and then he took up the arts in tandem, or or later, um, and he he made the arts kind of. He didn't want to start a monastery actually at first. He wanted to start a an arts center connected with Zen. Um, you know, he had you know gone very intensely into his own practice, um, but he wasn't really interested in becoming a teacher. He wanted to like offer Zen through the arts. And then people started coming to him and they were interested in the kind of intensive training that he had done. And they was like, shit, all right, fine. We're turning it into a monastery. <laughs> I, I really, I think that's a great motivation. I've, I've started on and off three arts co-ops. It's never really worked out because the glue, you know, organizations often work at a very primitive level. If we want to use like Maslow's hierarchy of, needs and values as like an example and so a lot there's a lot of projection scapegoating and without some sort of ideological glue if that's vajrayana buddhism or an ancient tr tradition like zen buddhism it doesn't really operate very well uh, without you calling it it ends up being like a norcal cult from the 70s or something like that it's just totally dysfunctional so I can see why he would transition out of wanting to have like an arts colony and maybe more into just because you it's probably just more efficient 
Um, the art, the, the 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 delivery of the art and the delivery of the Zen uh, turned out to be the traditional container of you know kind of re really quite intensive monasticism. I mean, there are stricter Rinzai places that are a little bit harder core, but you know, <laughs> there's in in the United States, uh, you know. In terms of like retreat days, ZMM is second or third. <laughs> and what, what do you think of Katagiri Roshi's uh, teachings and whatever lineage he left? Do you know? I much haven't about? looked. I mean, I, I I know the name. I'm I in in this context in this moment. I'm not remembering enough specifically. He he always to me was like the best looking of the, <laughs> of the Zen teachers. So I was like, oh. <laughs> it's so hard to be you know like a nice looking uh <laughs> master a lot of the time sometimes Dino, Dino roshi had 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 a kind of a funny looking face i think he wouldn't mind me saying so <laughs> and Shin, shinryu suzuki looked like a hyperspace elf or something like yeah. that and i always loved i love looking at him he makes this amazing frown when he when he gives teaching like this you know <laughs> <laughs> And then he mm. has this little voice like this. Uh, anyway, I, I, I ended up getting a lot of stories of Dido from uh, from Shugen Roshi um, and the other teachers there that I worked with while I was in residence there. Um, so I feel a, a, a debt, immense debt of gratitude to, to Dido Roshi and and Taizan Maizumi and you know that lineage, that stream of teaching. Well, I always feel a lot of um, appreciation for those of you who went through on the Zen path or who are treading that I read all the DT Suzuki books when I was in my twenties. And of course, Shinrizu Suzuki, I think at that point, he only had like the crooked cucumber bio, uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, and maybe one other book, um, on Shikantanza or something. But mm -hmm. I was like, these people are so fucking hardcore with their section. <laughs> <laughs> Sashin is really intense, you know, that like Sashin. <laughs> Sashin, yeah, Sashin. That's the that's the proper I don't Japanese pronunciation. Name. So mad respect. To no, you. I mean it's 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 really oh you know you're welcome. Uh, if you ever <laughs> want to do Sashin, I can I can tell you where to go for the no, not interested. <laughs> You, you don't want 18 hour retreat days, not much sleep and uh, to be like confronted one on one uh, with a teacher one, every day or multiple times a day. That's not. I mean, when we do long retreats in Vajrayana, you do have that length of the day, but there's a lot of dawdling. You know yeah, you there's mean? no dawdling. No yeah, dawdling there, at all. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like reading these really long, elaborate liturgies and visualizing this and doing no, no, that. No. It's, it's very, very, very chop, chop, always moving. You know, yeah. you're, you're sitting, you're completely still, absolutely no movement, or you are fully engaged, you know, and, and nothing in between. If you're, if you're, if you're, you're either, you know, drop dead in place like a corpse, or uh -huh. you're fully engaged and anything in between, you're slacking. <laughs> and what, what do you think of the efficacy of Cohen practice in the modern West? Do you? Oh, okay. So uh, I don't think anyone any any of my teachers would mind me saying it uh their opinion con considered opinion is that it is a, is a it's a dying practice tradition okay yeah people are confused by just driving to whole foods and figuring out which uh dried fruit they want so that 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 confrontation with practical koan practices burned us out on actually investigation yeah <laughs> i mean ko koan Koan practice is is its own whole thing, and um, I could go into it, but that's not really the subject of this this episode of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I did I did want to like I know my camera's gonna like over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're I think we we covered all the topics that I I had in mind and wanted to get to, and this is a good length of podcast. So, and that, I just wanted to lastly say, I encourage people to practice tantra. I think tantra is for curious people. And I think it's not as prescriptive as is rendered by modern Tibetan lamas. I think in the West, we have now we've inherited this incredible playground of postural, um, using postural visualization and yogic practice. And the confluence of those activities are a great opportunity for those of us in the West to work with intensity, think more 
sanely about how we relate not only to our own energetic system, but the energetic systems of those around us, how we operate within the framework of projection and an understanding how to set better boundaries, assert better needs, all these kind of this subtext is built into Tantra. And I, I don't always think it's in the Lama's best interest to expose this because the raison d'etre of tantric practice is unqualified absorption as awareness right but it also has these really nice um supportive aspects that if those of us who are interested in therapy and just having like not living like mila repa and just having like a nicer experience it's been really gratifying and I just want to encourage people don't be scared off and don't think you can't do it. No, absolutely not. Yeah. So I, I think it's so it's a lot to imbibe and metabolize, but once you get it, it becomes second nature, just like uh, making love or having a partner or making um, your favorite stew. It's just about ingredients, a little bit of mindfulness and probably going to accelerate your growth if you have someone to work with you who's been through it, you know, who's gone to cooking school, work with that person. <laughs> Try not to get it all from books because it's just going to it's going to generate a lot of confusion, especially if it's a Tibetan form. Because yeah. there's the four main schools and within those four main schools, there's like sub lineages. And within those sub lineages, there's like a million tantric cycles and there's just not enough time to know all that um, for those of us who aren't haven't been trained since age four to read all the texts, memorize the texts. And, you know, we don't have like my teacher probably has, I don't know, hun hundreds of thousands of students, basically. So uh, I just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if go for it, <laughs> if, if people are interested, dive right in, contact Peter. Um, yeah, if Michael Michael Taft's great. Michael Taft, yeah. Char Charlie and uh, David Chapman are doing some mm -hmm. really interesting stuff. If you want to go the more traditional route, uh, of course, you know a lot of the Nyingma Lamas, Galuk Lamas that are Mingyu Rinpoche, Zongsar Kinchur Rinpoche. Um, there's all kinds of teachers, but make sure and really examine the teacher and get to know them. And just if they know what it was like to grow up with Xbox or to grow up with <laughs> electronic music and raves and, you know, smoking pot in eighth grade or whatever, you're probably going to have a better practice yeah. experience. So I just want to encourage, you know, people to practice because it's once you get a sense of how it works, it's great fun. Great fun. Great yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> Moving from from hard Zen practice into working with my my teacher uh, Lama Justin von Voidash, um, who is, who was born in Brooklyn, right? Um, oh, I so know that. that that's been a really really wonderful uh, experience, a nice a nice change of pace, <laughs> and really and fun. I, <laughs> I also want to say I, everyone who's watching this should thank Wiston for being sort of like this online Hermes kind of figure who's willing to interact and joyfully um, try to metabolize and repeat back to what other people are thinking in such a gentle and loving way. I just want you to know that I have a lot of respect for that. Like you're so gentle, you're out there with a lot of the love and you actually listen to people, repeat it back to them and you take the time to work, help them work through what they're actually saying. And I think just that, kind of like adamantine wisdom is really what's needed in the social media realm. So I want to express my gratitude to you for taking that role. I don't know how long you'll be able to handle it but for now. It's going good. okay so far. It's going okay so far. And people, people are providing they're, they're, they're you know, I'm teaching one-on-ones um, under the auspices of, you know, Shinzen's teacher certification. Um, and that's, that's, that's keeping me fed and housed. Um, so I'll keep doing it as long as that's the case, I think. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, um, thank you for having me on. If uh, 
it, yeah, we'll, we'll do more things. And uh, final note, Winston and I were talking about doing a little video of mudra and how to work with your Vajra and Bell. Absolutely. So look out if you if you have if you have one of these or you are or you're interested in acquiring such and doing the traditional uh, tantric you know sadhana practice, there are ritual forms which I am not yet expert in, um, but Peter is. So we're going to release a little bit of a video on that. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. that's part of the great fun is actually knowing how to use, you know, that that bell. Funnily enough, is called music in in the in the in the sadhana so i remember i was like what this is not music this is, this is horrible but you, get, yeah. you know music i love it it's an it's an acquired taste it's, it's an acquired taste yeah I, I saw the Gyudo monks, I, I posted this on Twitter the other day, I saw them many times, but I saw them in like, I saw them with Houston Smith, who sort of was the first Westerner to discover them. And, you know, it's just that it's so big, right? This, the sound, the sound of the Mahakala practice. And it's, you know, it's like the sounds of the body are being replicated by the sounds of the of the various uh, musical instruments and then the mudras and oh, it's just such a beautiful thing. And um, I'm really rambling right now. We should probably end it <laughs> before your, before your camera overheats. It's yeah. all, it's all good, but we, we yeah. let's maybe, maybe cap it off here. So where can people find you, um, Peter? Uh, yeah. If you want to get in touch with me or join our, our little Vajrayana enclave on Discord. I'm always around on Discord to answer questions or direct you to the appropriate teachers. Like if it's a Zen question or a Shinzen question, you know, maybe Wiston will come on there and answer some questions. But if you have Vajrayana questions, uh, go to the field.us and, field and I'll get you integrated. There's no cost. Uh, and we're sort of a sister culture to the emerging ground people, my neighbors over here, uh, David Chapman and Char Rinzen, Charlie. Yeah, no, I, did, I interviewed Charlie um, uh, last year a bit. So if you haven't checked that out, go, go, go see. I'm really also yeah. a fan of what they're up to. So she does. I'm much more stodgy and traditional in the way I do <laughs> things. She's just sort of made up her own religion. So I have a lot of respect for that. I don't have the courage to do that but uh she does so good for her okay um Thanks. yeah thanks thanks so much for coming on peter um if folks are interested in what i'm up to uh i'll, I'll put my link um down below somewhere wiston tbs i'm also on x twitter whatever um yeah okay uh, thanks for tuning in bye bye everybody take care practice tantra yeah get practice into it tantra. <laughs> good for you <laughs> okay bye bye <laughs>